In this video, I, I'm going to start talking about 11 of the uh, world's great uh, living uh, religious traditions. And today I will start with Hinduism. Um, Hinduism is an ancient religious tradition along with Judaism, uh, the, 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 perhaps the most ancient continuous religious traditions on the planet. As some have recently referred to Hinduism and Judaism as kind of mother traditions, uh, Hinduism uh, and the religions of India, uh, so many other movements have arisen uh, from the kind of background of the, of the Vedic and Brahminical uh, civilization of ancient India. And Judaism, we'll talk about another day with its offspring. And yet, old as this religious tradition is, it's ever new. It's still a vital tradition of over a billion people on the planet. And the influence of Hinduism is, uh, is stronger than ever. Because uh, Hinduism's ideas uh, have proven to be quite attractive to people in many parts of the world, which is witnessed by the widespread practice of yoga. And yoga, of course, is a Sanskrit word, has many meanings, um, can mean union, it can mean to relink, it can mean to connect up, to bind oneself to the divine. We'll talk more about that perhaps in another setting. So an ancient tradition, an influential tradition, a mother tradition of many other traditions, uh, and yet how to characterize this tradition in a few words, in, in 10 minutes, impossible, it would take a lifetime. Um, so many places to start. But I would say that at the very heart of Hinduism is a notion of, of oneness. And this is interpreted in many ways, and I don't want to enter into any of those controversies here, and I don't mean to foreclose on any possible interpretation of Hinduism, but there is a, an idea at the heart of most Hindu traditions that this reality in which we live is fundamentally one and is an expression of the supreme divine reality known as Brahman. Theological differences, philosophical differences abound in all directions. But yet, at the very heart of this tradition, we do find what I like to think of as Hinduism's inclusion principle an attempt to include rather than to exclude. Instead of saying it's this, not that, it's more like saying, yes, this too, perhaps. It's possible that it's this as well and this as well. And so that gives rise to the idea, which is classically associated with some forms of Hinduism, that truth or reality is one, but the ways to express it are, are, are quite diverse, or to state it very memorably, as was stated by one Swami 50 years ago, Swami Satchitananda, truth is one, paths are many, which is from a Sanskrit expression that is found in the, in the Vedas, the, holy, the holiest scriptures of Hinduism. How to find uh, the, the center of this tradition? I think that, at least philosophically and religiously, that is one center, this notion of trying to fit everything together into one whole. This principle was expressed beautifully and famously in one of the Upanishads many, many thousands of years ago when the great figure taught what's known as the honey doctrine. And it goes on for many, many, many uh, verses, but one very memorable verse is where the, the teacher, the, the Rishi, says that the, that the earth is the honey of all beings, and all beings are the honey of the earth. Oh, long before, I, I think even in Greece, notions of the un, unity of being had arisen, this subtle, sophisticated sense of the, of the co-relativity, the co-creativity of all phenomena was already deeply in, in place. Because the earth, if you will, is the food and the life of all of its creatures. But on the other hand, all of its creatures are the life or the food of the earth itself. There's a, a mutual dependency. And one can even see already some of the central doctrines of Buddhism, uh, the mutual dependence of all phenomena, the co-relativity of all phenomena arising from this ancient Upanishadic teaching. I think that idea captures many of the schools of Hinduism. Even if all would not agree that, as, the, as some schools of Vedanta say, that at the depth of our being, we are the divine, that this self, this atma, is Brahman. 
Even if not all schools would agree on that or would give different emphases to it, I think the honey doctrine captures a more broadly this notion of inclusivity that's at the very center of many, 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 if not all Hindu traditions. Some other central ideas that, are, that we can find in, in Hinduism, um, and I don't want to overstate these teachings, and I don't. I, I want to be aware that Hinduism should be in, can interpret itself. But there are many Hindus and many varieties of Hinduism. But one idea is that the universe itself is divine. It's blessed throughout because it is divine substance. There is nothing that is not divine substance. And the theologians differ on how this is understood, but the but what remains is that everything is an outpouring, an outflowing of the divine radiance. And as a consequence, at the core of our being, to use the Upanishad expre expression, in the cave of the heart, if we were to go within yogically through meditation, we would begin to experience and to sense that that divinity, that divine reality resides deep within us. And this is what gives rise in some forms of Hinduism to the notion that ultimately there's an indissoluble unity or oneness or even identity between my deepest self and the supreme truth of life. So um, these ideas have proven to be quite attractive to people outside of Hinduism. The first well-known teacher of Hinduism to travel uh, outside of India to the West was Swami Vivekananda, who appeared uh, on the stage of the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. And he proclaimed ideas just like this to an audience of Chicagoans of that day, uh, and uh, they were thunderstruck by the sublimity of his teaching, and many were even shocked that we had been sending missionaries to that country when they sh could be sending people like Swami Vivekananda to us. That was the beginning of the first yoga boom in the United States and in the West. Swami Vivekananda, he taught, uh, he taught a mental yoga, a meditative yoga. He didn't teach hatha yoga or physical yoga. It was perhaps too early for that. Um, but with Swami Vivekananda, now words that up until that point were really not known outside of India, and maybe to a few specialists, words that now are so familiar to us started to make their way into the consciousness of the globe. Yoga. Who thinks about yoga much any longer? But it's a Sanskrit word, and it was completely unknown to most of our great-grandparents depending upon how old you are, uh, unless you're from India, of course. I mean, my, my grandparents, but certainly not my great-grandparents, had never heard of yoga. Uh, and dharma, which I mentioned in, in the last lecture, is a central idea in Hinduism as well. Um, and I think probably the way in for most, most people, the way, place where Hinduism really does seem to have an impact upon people who are not Hindus, is through uh, yoga tradition and through the Vedanta philosophy. Because the idea that in the depth of our being, we are divine, we're, we're basically uh, hiding out here in the world of maya or illusion, having forgotten our divine selves, this is a different idea from much of mainstream Western religiosity. And that's one reason why it's proven so popular, I think. There are certainly schools of Hinduism that are much more like... Uh, uh, like the Abrahamic religions, which posit a, a fundamental difference at the heart of ourselves between ourselves and the divine, but they haven't proven to be as popular globally, and it seems to me it's because we have that. We have that idea. And the idea, however, as Swami Vivekananda said, that you are immortal, you are divine, it's actually a lie to call you sinners. This was a new idea. And this accounts for much, I think, of the global spread of Hinduism as a religious and philosophical and spiritual uh, way of life or, or, or religious tradition. Uh, other ideas that, uh, that are, are associated with Hinduism um, that, uh, that may be a newer to people are, is the notion of, uh, of moksha. Uh, there are numerous terms in, in the Hindu traditions for the ultimate state, salvation perhaps in the Christian tradition, but moksha or freedom, freedom from illusion, freedom from separateness. This is also a central idea in the Hindu tradition. The notion of, of maya, 
or that the the realm of experience is in somehow a a, a kind of story that we that we tell ourselves and that is not ultimately congruent with the things with the way things are or maya as a kind of creative principle whereby the divine reality unfolds itself as our experience this is a, an idea of cosmic proportion and it really can completely alter your consciousness to come into terms with, and to come into contact with some of these ideas and of course quite central for almost as long as the notion of yoga is the notion of karma and karma essentially it's not fatalism it's basically the idea that what goes around comes around or what goes around comes around and that we are defined by our deeds and if we would have a better life then we should act more nobly because when we act ignobly then our lives do not turn out as well as we would like them to be